I was gone, you know, circumstances happened. I lost my husband. He passed away in 2022. And the Lord, you know, put on my heart and said for us to come back here. And I thank God because, you know, we had a house here and now we were like, let's go ahead and sell the house. But my husband said, no, keep the house because you never know what might happen one day. But when my husband got sick, he wasn't working. I wasn't working because I had to come home and take care of him. And he said, let's go ahead and sell the house. Even though he didn't want to, but our situation was like, let's sell the house. And so we were supposed to close on the house on February the 3rd. That's when we were supposed to close on the house. But he passed away on that same day. So I called off and said, we are not going to sell the house. So we didn't sell the house, not knowing that God would say, come back the following, you know, in 20, uh, 2023. When he told me to come back, it was on a Saturday. He confirmed his word. I told my children, we're going back. They were like, what? I said, we're going back. That was Saturday. Monday, because I left Georgia, my teaching license had expired with everything that was going on. So I called the district, and they said, are you, are you coming back? I said, yes. They said, don't worry about it. We'll send your paperwork. I, they said, just go to the state of um, the Georgia professional standards and check your, and just fill out the paperwork. When I did, they said, it's going to take a couple of months because they're on back order. And so that was Monday. Tuesday, I called the county, and they said, well, the problem is not you coming back. The problem is you deciding where you want to be. I didn't have to interview for a job. Someone say favor. I didn't have to interview for a job. I had a job. And I was sitting at work. The Lord said, go and check your, 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 the, the state website where your license is. That was on Wednesday. They already processed my paper. It was done. Yeah. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. We are moving, praying about the house. God, I have to sell this house. He gave me a figure. He said, this is what your house is going to sell for. I don't care what's going on with the market. This is what your house is going to sell for. I called my realtor, who was a, a man of God. I told him, I said, this is the number that the Lord gave me. He said, we're going to see, you know, praise God. He said, I trust you because every time God tells you something, this is what happens. Yeah. We put the house, um, we, you know, he said, that's what we're going to do. He said, we're going to put the, the house on the market. I told God, I said, Lord, I need this house to sell in five days. I don't want everybody coming in this house. I said, it's only one family that is supposed to live in this house. That's the family that I want to come in this house. On June the 10th, they put the house on the market. Um, I was driving my children to bring them back to Georgia because I still had to pack in, um, everything. On my way, uh, the realtor called me. He said, well, God is good. I said, yes. He said, well, only one person came to the open house. I said, it was? He said, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, the agent. He said, but he had the buyer, the couple on the, on the line. He said, what impressed them on your house were the scriptures that you had written on the wall. Ooh. He said, and they said they have to, you know, they have to have the house. He said, but this is the thing, woman of God. He said the exact number that you said the Lord spoke was the exact Ooh. number that they offered for the house. You can't tell me God is not good. But God everybody know that some of us that are in education in this country, it costs to go to school. And my student loan debt was $189,851. That was my student loan debt. So even though coming back here, you know, the, 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 they put us on forbearance, but they said it was supposed to start next month. So on the 14th, a day before my daughter's birthday, you know, the Lord just said, call them. So I called them. She was like, I said, I went on the website. I keep saying that I had a zero balance. She said, well, yes, you should be getting an official letter. Your loan is forgiven. $189,851 debt paid for. Hallelujah. I said, God, is, I just got a free education. But how many people can say favor? I was just thinking, I said, you know, if I could sing. That was a gift that when God was giving that out, I must have overslept. But if I could sing, I would say, what the enemy meant for evil, God has turned it around, turned it around. What the enemy meant for evil, God has turned it around for my good. Praise so the I Lord! Oh, where's your voice of triumph? Where is your shout of triumph? You want to praise God? You want to praise Him? Oh, like all Satalia. Look. Did you catch that? 
back to back testimonies. Back to back testimonies. Look at the favor of God that was speaking for her. Oh, Father, we give you praise. You know, when we acknowledge the goodness of God over our life, it multiplies. The testimonies here will multiply. You see, cancellation of death is going to be like that. Our communion house, in the mighty name of Jesus, don't be afraid. Don't think I'm not qualified for it. The Lord has qualified you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So tonight, our prayers is Psalms, Psalms 107 verse 2. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. The Lord has redeemed you from the hands of the enemy. You know what the enemy has come to do? He's come to steal, kill, and destroy everything that concerns you. So tonight you are going to open your mouth. You are the redeemed of the Lord. If it looks like the enemy is overpowering you in certain areas of your life, in your health, in your work, wherever it is, you begin to say, I am the redeemed of the Lord. I have been redeemed. I have been saved. Begin to prophesy into your life. Begin to cough off your blessings. Open your mouth because you are coming back to tell Testify. You are coming back to give God praise. You are coming back to give him a shout of praise. I am the redeemed of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, righteousness, peace, and joy reigns in this house. In the name of Jesus, we are the redeemed of the Lord. The favor of the Lord speaks for us. In the mighty name of Jesus. We are the redeemed of the Lord and we begin to say so. The hand of the Lord was upon Elijah and Elijah outran the chariots. This is our passion that's coming your house in the mighty name of Jesus. I come and speak for us. We are the redeemed of the Lord. Gentiles will come to our light. Oh, kings, we come to the brightness of our light. Lord, we decree we are a people favored by you. Lord, we give you praise. Oh, Father, we exalt you. Father, we give you praise. Hey, my last Satale Kuriana, Lima Les, and say Kuriana, Father Lord, we begin the manifestation of your blessings. The manifestations of our breakthrough is coming forth in the mighty name of Jesus. Makalabado, Sataliana, Zing Satale Kuriana, Shetayanado, Makalabadi, Sata. Lord, we exalt you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Psalms 107 verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. For it is good. For his mercy endures forever. I want us to give God thanks. Give him thanks for the prayers that you just said. Because he has answered you. Give him thanks for the prayers that you've just petitioned. Because the Lord has answered you. Give him thanks. Father Lord, we thank you. Lord, we give you praise. We exalt you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Come on, somebody. God is good. Let's celebrate the Lord. There's such an air of celebration in the camp. Such an air of celebration. I don't know about you, but, but it's here. You can smell it. The testimonies are coming forth. How many can agree, can tap into what our sister Roberta shared with us? How many need that movement in our lives? But I'm here to encourage us tonight. There is celebration in the camp. Press into it. The scriptures declare, my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. I don't know about you, but we have been made to sit 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the throne. And the Lord is moving in our behalf. That's plenty to celebrate. Let's give the Lord praise for his love. Hallelujah. This is Communion House where we fellowship, we equip, we disciple. Let's take a quick two minutes just to go love on somebody. Go across the sanctuary, greet them with the holy kiss. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's make our way back to our seats best we can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for virtue. Hallelujah. Let's prepare to receive the man of God. While the minstrels are here, we give God praise for them. Hallelujah. And I thank God for my dear brothers that are here that were able to make it to the conference uh, yesterday and this morning. We had such a great time in the presence of the Lord. And, you know, sometimes it is not until you visit the camp of your fellow comrades that you're, number one, able to appreciate where you have come, but also you're in a place to also be poured into, you see, to be of encouragement to others and let them be of encouragement to you. So we give God praise for indeed the body has the mind of Christ. Let us take just a couple of seconds to pray in the Holy Ghost as we prepare to receive an on-time word, Father, we give you praise. For the man of God that you have set before us, O oh God, the mantle that you have made available unto us, there is none like you, O oh God, for you indeed have done this by your love. Lord, we thank you for the ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you and give you praise for this mighty one you have set before us. Amen, and so be it. Let us celebrate and welcome the man of God, Prophet Moses Anderson. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's be seated. Let us all be seated. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Am I sounding like me? Is this what it sounds like usually? Okay. All righty. Yet it is I, not another. I don't know, but it sounds a little different. I don't know. Are you still working on it? Okay, thank you. All righty. I like to, um, you know, when the Bible records the sound of Jesus' voice in Revelations, the Bible says it was like thunder upon many waters. And so I like to sound like my voice is thunder upon many waters. Oh, yeah, that's more like it. Yes. Yeah, now this will scare the enemy, I think. Oh, yeah, God is good. Praise the Lord. And um, tonight we will get right into it, but I will ask you seven questions tonight. It's not like a test, but it might be. 
You see, because it is for me to say it is one thing, but it is for you to hear. And not for everybody. Some may hear it as another. I just need to make that distinction. You see, because we must not forget the people that we are. We are a peculiar people. You see, we have uniquenesses as individuals that are completely inexplicable. And it's okay because we don't have to explain who we are all the time. We have to leave room for what we are called. We are called a mystery. And so it is okay for us to remain a mystery. You understand? What is not okay is for you to not pursue understanding of mysteries when it comes to the things that God has revealed to you and the things that he has for you. But you yourself, it's okay for you to be a mystery. And so some of the questions will come to you in one way and the others may come to you in another. That is going to make sense in just a moment. In fact, let me help you make it make sense already. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. Hallelujah. Please don't be tired of Jeremiah just yet. I spent almost a year just studying Genesis. So it's your turn now. Jeremiah 17, 22. The Bible says, Nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath, as I commanded your fathers. The Lord is saying in do not carry a burden on the Sabbath out of your houses, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath. Somebody say, hallow the Sabbath. So the reason why this is going to help us make sense of the questions that we have been asked today is because we need to know that the Sabbath has been fulfilled. You see, because what does the Sabbath represent? The Bible says, on after God made man on the sixth day, on the seventh, he rested from all his work and he blessed the, the Sabbath and called it holy. So the Sabbath became a holy convocation unto the Lord. But to you and I, the Sabbath can be all kinds of things if we don't understand what it really is. To some people, that which is meant to be rest has become a burden. Sabbath is the day of rest. And God intended for man to observe the Sabbath just because of the place where man was at the time. Man was at a place wherein he did not even know what was good for him, nor could he be trusted with his own affairs completely. You know, because this same man, when he was placed in the garden, was told not to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, because the day that he partakes of it, he shall die. And what did he do? He partook of it. God had to come and intervene with the blood of an animal, because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Even though he had an opportunity to continue to have some form of life, it wasn't exactly the originally designed life. And when I say originally designed, it doesn't mean that God did not know that other pathway was going to be constructed or um, it, it's not, not constructed, but that pathway would emerge. So God already knew that it would emerge and he provide, made provision for it. But the thing that happened afterwards was God unveiled another set of principles that he had in place and in mind to ensure that until man can think with the mind of Christ, he needs to be guided by a set of rules called laws. And those rules are still in effect today, till today. You know, God had to teach them in the Old Testament that whenever they needed to go, that they should not just go around the camp. That they needed to go far from the camp and dig the ground so that their waste is put away so as not to accommodate illnesses or so as not to accommodate parasites or organisms that can make them sick. Can you imagine God had to teach them that? 
That was how crude they had become and uncivilized. And God is like, ah, they need help even in that department. And so all of the laws that God put in place, he put in place. In fact, I was thinking about this earlier today before I left the house. I was thinking about how now many people are talking about the use of coconut oil and olive oil as um, antimicrobial ointments because when you rub those things, they actually destroy things that want to harm you. The other day I was having toothache and I asked my wife, I mean, I told my wife, I said, I may have to go to the dentist. And she was like, "Uh, why do you want to do that? I said, because I want this tooth to stop aching. She was like, well, you don't need the dentist for your tooth to stop aching. And I already knew where she was going with that. I'm like, okay, here we go again. So I sat down. In fact, I didn't sit down. She sat me down and she was like, open your mouth. And then she put some oil in it. She anointed me with oil. And before you knew what was going on, I was devouring meat again like a beast. You see, I know there was power in the prayer that she said, but then at the same time, the oil has healing properties on its own because of the fact that the oil was instrumented by God to be able to take care of things that you do not see. The oil is designed to take care of things that you cannot see. The oil, even though physical to you, is transient between this world and the other. It moves between the seen and the unseen. And that is the reason why you need to guide the oil. Because the Bible says that the oil of the perfumer when it is polluted by flies, begins to send forth a stinking smell. For those of you who are students of the King James Bible, it says the flies cause the oil of the apothecary to send forth a stinking smell. You do not want the oil to be exposed to contaminants. You want to expose contaminants to the oil. You may want to write that down because this is one of those situations wherein even though you have read from left to right, now you have to read from right to left because contaminants in the oil, they make it less potent. In fact, if anything at all, they can turn the oil to something harmful. But when contaminants themselves are exposed to the oil, it brings healing. But where I was going with that was that laws were introduced by God To preserve man until man learns how to do righteously. Can I say that again? If I let me read you a verse of scripture from the book of Psalms 106. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Psalm 106 verses 1 and 2. You know, because sometimes my wife says I like to copy her. So this time she read 107. I'm reading 106. That's not particularly copying, is it? It might be close. But 106 ain't 107. Alrighty, 106. I didn't even realize how much I copied my wife until the other day we went somewhere to order food. And the lady there was like, will you try something different from what your wife is having one day? I said, what do you mean? She was like, you always wait for her to order. And you're like, same thing. So I said to her, what did she order this time? She said, "Uh, she wants to have a sample of this new dish. I was like, same thing. It's just easy. You know, that way I, I, I tell people my wife is sometimes my auxiliary brain. Instead of me to think, I just, yeah, praise God. The Bible says, praise the Lord. Psalms 106, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy is endure forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all of his praise? Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. So until we were capable of righteousness at all times, the Lord introduced the law. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament that the law is not made for the righteous. Are you with me? That the law is not made for the righteous simply because. Now let me explain this Psalms 106 a little bit. You see, how many of us here are confident to say that 
by our own observation and caution, we can do righteousness at all times. Okay, so there are no aliens amongst us. We're all men. Because maybe some aliens are capable of not doing unrighteousness, I mean, of doing righteousness all the time. But for us, the Bible says the thoughts of a man's heart are evil continually. Even the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? That is not a license for nonsense, but it is a way of keeping us humble. But then, God who knew that we have a frame that is susceptible to sin, to all kinds of vices, decided not to look at the work of our hands, but to look into our hearts. Right from the Old Testament, it has been revealed that the eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for the man whose heart is stayed on God. Why has God always been after the heart? David said, if you would take sacrifices, I am ready to give. He said, but I have come to know that the sacrifices of God are not bulls or rams, but they are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. The day that I posed that question to the Holy Spirit, which was in fact the Holy Spirit staring that question in me, that, I, that he may bring me to a place of understanding, he said to me, he said, because the Almighty never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So he's looking where he has always looked. And if he once looked at your works, then what's going to happen now that Christ is in you? The reason why God has always looked at the heart is because he's known that he has a provision that one day this mind will be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so I stand here today to remind you that you are that one that can do righteousness always because you have become righteousness in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you and I, we have become righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And what does that mean? What that means is that now I can utter the great works of God and I can declare his promises because it takes being able to, uh, being, it takes being in right standing with God all the time to be able to see that goodness that endures forevermore. So I am qualified for that goodness that exists forevermore and that mercy that is renewed every day simply because every time God sees me, I am in right standing with him as long as I am standing in Christ. You know, Jesus is seated at the right hand. So if you are in Christ Jesus, you are what? In the right all the time. It is very simple geometry, but it is exactly the greatest privilege of all. Now, what did I tell you about the law? The law was made to somewhat keep us in line until we are yoked with Christ so that we are always in line. Before we were yoked with Christ, we could go here or there. We had the capacity to veer off the path of life every now and again. And that is the reason why the Bible says it is highly commendable when you find a man who has gray hair who is still in the path of righteousness because normally that doesn't happen. And so whenever it happens, it becomes a thing of great commendation. But now that you are yoked with Christ, you are always walking the line as far as your heavenly father is concerned. So let's go back to the issue of the Sabbath. Because I wanted you to understand the reason why the Sabbath was once a law. Even though the Sabbath was meant to be for you. You know when you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament makes it seem like the Sabbath is for God. No, he already rested. He's enjoying his own Sabbath. So whether you rest or not, it doesn't change anything about God's situation. The rest is for you. But because it came as part of the law, and why would God do that? He did that because where man was at the time, man did not have the sensibility to do things right because he doesn't have the sensitivity to the love of God as he should. There was a time that the heart of man was like that of a beast responsive only to force and fear. And that is the reason why it appeared as though the God of the Old Testament was always coming by force and by fear. Because there was a time that humanity was like a toddler that needed to be spanked every now and again. That needed to be yelled at. 
You see, if you're still yelling at your teenager, that's because you didn't yell at them enough when they were toddlers. Because there are certain kind of yelling that you would have done. You see what I mean? My wife, whenever my wife brings out the wooden spoon, even little William now, who is only four, you don't have to spank him with that wooden spoon because he already knows. Just through the side of his eyes, if he sees that thing, he knows to put on the whole armor of God. <laughs> when he sees that, he becomes the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He begins to do what he's supposed to do simply because he had, he's had a taste of that goodness and his life is not the same again. Like David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He has tasted that thing and now he knows. You see, because there is a progression to these things. And so that was the reason why back in the day, someone commits a sin by just stretching for their finger to touch the Ark of the Covenant. Whoa, the Lord strikes them. And you're like, man, this God is not as nice as I thought he was. Well, maybe not nice, but he is fair. Because what he's doing was, he was taking us through the process of understanding the boundaries that exist. You see, the beauty of the way that God deals with us is such that it takes us from, it takes us line upon line, precept upon precept. There is a maturity model that God takes us through. And the reason why all of those laws and all of those sacrifices were required in the Old Testament was to build within us and to build for us a value system that would allow for us to appreciate the grace of God. You know, sometimes I just think about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and I just begin to cry. I begin to weep because I remember that I once read or that I have read in the Old Testament how many sacrifices people had to offer for their sins. And here I am, I don't have to do that. If not for all those requirements, we may have just thought the grace of God was a given. It is what it is, but no. It is a great privilege that has come to give us what? To give us rest. And that is the reason why Jesus said to the Pharisees who accused his disciples of stretching forth their hand to harvest grains on the Sabbath. When they accused Jesus, I mean his disciples, basically they were accusing Jesus. They said, how would you allow your disciples to do this unholy thing? Do, you, do they not know that it is the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You see, the same things that God has made for you to enjoy, if you don't have the mindset of love and the mindset of being a child of God, you will suffer in the hands of the same thing. You will come under the burden of the things that are supposed to be a blessing. And that was why Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. The Lord God Almighty instituted the Sabbath because he was resting from all his work. And if you are in Christ Jesus, you're expected to be what? rested from all your works because all the works of righteousness that we put up before Jesus came were sort of just kind of like the heaven was just checking the boxes but in reality it was like filthy rags before God but God was like well, let's just keep going they will get it when the time comes and so if I am resting from all my works because the Lord Jesus has come then do I need another Sabbath I have my Sabbath in Christ Jesus. But you know that life is multidimensional. And so I no longer have to work for my righteousness because I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So now what do I do? I just now go ahead and do the good works, which means to bear fruits. You know, it's, it's different when you're working to be approved and when you have been approved to work. It's like preparing for a job. Everything that you do is to get that job. And then once you get the job, what do they do? They give you more work. I mean, I never understood it. I would study for an exam just to get into that school. And the moment I get into that school, they ask me to study some more. But the reality of it is the study that I 
that I put in to get in there was to get me approved. And once I got in there, I study more to get me what improved. <coughs> that was a good one, but only Anita likes it. So I think we should just make a t-shirt, just you and me. Approved to be improved. Anybody else who wants it would have to uh, consider you after 12 months. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, my wife says being a realtor, she's always thinking of approved. <laughs> People are always getting approved for mortgages, approved for, wow, that was, you know, my wife's been hanging out with me for a while, so she's coming into that dad jokes now. Yeah, she's, well done to you, Rosemary. I am no longer alone in my kind of sense of humor. That's the kind of things that I would come up with and I would laugh and laugh and people would just look at me and feel sorry. <laughs> but I think I'm getting better. Oh yeah, I don't crack my cannibal jokes as much as I used to. Alan is losing me back there. Because that was my genre. When I, in my days as a traveling consultant, everywhere that I went to, once I introduced myself as a consultant handling the project, I always told them that, and by the way, one of my favorite things to do is to crack cannibal jokes. And people will look at me and wonder if they're still safe. <laughs> the word of the Lord has come forth saying to us that we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. So all of that. <coughs> wow, I'm not trying to copy you. It was just a coincidence. All of that I say somewhat to prepare us for these seven questions. Now, let me give you an insight in case you haven't thought about it. What is the number of the Sabbath? Seven. Seven is the number of the Sabbath. So these questions are questions that are supposed to bring you to rest. Matthew chapter one, verse two. How do you just keep, keep your cough to yourself? Because from here, I kind of pick up on different things, and I think this time around, the cough was one of it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says, let's even read verse 1. The Bible says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. You know, at the men's conference that we were in today, someone reminded us of the meaning of being God's friend. You know, when you are God's friend, God shares everything that he has with you. Because Jesus is the son of God. But because David was a friend of God and Abraham was a friend of God, Jesus shared his son with them. He says, my son can bear your name. Because when you look at it, he says, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. I thought Jesus was the son of God, but he says we're the son of David, the son of Abraham, because God just lets us know right from the introduction of Jesus that when you are his friend, everything that he is God is now yours. I want to be his friend. I am a friend of God because he calls me friend. <coughs> Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Question number one is this. Why not the others? I mean, of all the children that Jacob had, he had 12 boys and several girls. He had... Sons and daughters, but only one was mentioned. Why Judah? <laughs> I'm going to answer this question with question number two. Come with me to Second Peter. I mean, First Peter, chapter two, verse three. Don't worry, just uh, be ready to watch this thing online so that you don't miss a thing. But if you can take notes also while you're listening, that's awesome. So 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. And then we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4 after this one. It says, as newborn 
First Peter chapter 2, verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. In fact, let's read from verse 1 so that you can get context because I'm kind of reading verse 3 because I, I know where this is going. So therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. By the way, these things that are listed here were the things that the other children of Jacob were somewhat guilty of. As newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted of the Lord's grace or that you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. I told you that you have been approved to be improved. The Bible is saying, don't put away malice so that you can be saved. But now that you are saved, let it show that you are saved. Malice should no longer be seen in you. You are now supposed to be a doer of good works, not because you are trying to earn your salvation. No, that one is a gift. It was given to you. But now that you have received that gift, if you have truly tasted of the graciousness of the Lord, put all these things away. So the answer to question, I mean, oh, okay, was I supposed to tell you the answer? Okay, let me just tell you the answer. The answer to question number one, why Judah? It's because Judah found grace. Now, when you look at the embodiment of the Lord Jesus Christ, the summary of his essence is called grace. Just like when you look at the Heavenly Father, the Heavenly Father is called what? Love. God is love. Jesus is grace. And the Holy Spirit is sweet fellowship. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And so when you look at what we're seeing here, we are seeing that because Judah had found grace, guess what happened? Grace was found in him. And so in the genealogy of Jesus, who is grace, Judah had to be named because he found grace. So I want you to now understand, if you haven't thought about it, that the expression, I am who I am by the grace of God, literally means you are elected by God and now included in the family of righteousness because of the grace of God. So the very first question is, why Judah? How come he made it into the family of the Son of God? Because he found grace. And for those of us who have learned to read from left to right and right to left, you would also understand that what it means to find grace is to be found by grace. Because if grace had not found you, you couldn't find grace on your own because grace was not in the world where you were. In the world where you were rescued from, the only thing you had was the law. And so you had to be found by grace and translated into his world. That is the reason why the Bible says, oh, give thanks to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has translated us from darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And so all of these people... They cannot boast of having accomplished anything that impressed God other than the fact that they believed and it was imputed unto them for righteousness. It was grace that found them. So question number two, which we just read, I read it, but I didn't bring out the question. The question that we can see from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 is this. Why then do I struggle to put away these things? Why? Why do I struggle to put away malice? Why do I struggle to put away these things, knowing fully well that I have indeed been found by grace? The answer is very simple. I found it in the book of Mark, chapter 3. Come with me to Mark, chapter 3, verse 16. Let's look at this scenario together. Mark, chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says in Mark chapter 3, verse 16, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. 
<laughs> Simon, to whom Jesus gave the name Peter. So when he was born, he was called Simon. But Jesus was like, this name is not helping this man. I will give him another name. The reason why we struggle, even though we have tasted of the graciousness of God, that was the reason why Peter was asking a question. He was like, if indeed you have tasted of the graciousness of God, why are you struggling to put away malice? Why are you struggling with the works of the flesh? Why are we still struggling? When in fact the Bible says that whosoever is born of God does not sin. Your spirit does not sin. Why can't your body and your actions and your thoughts simply take instructions from your spirit? You know the reason why? Because you are still answering the old name Simon when indeed he has called you Peter. Every time the spirit of temptation comes, he calls you Simon. But the Lord has given you a new name. He has called you Petrus, the rock. He has called you the one that is immovable, that is unshakable, the one that does not fall for the temptations that come to blow you to and fro. But every time they call Simon, you say, here I am. When you're supposed to ignore that name now that you are Peter. It is the only way by which we will make the grace of God of full effect in our lives when we recognize how to shun the old name and answer only to the new. You know, when Jesus saw Satan in the presence of God, asking for work, Satan went to God and he was like, just like he went to God when Job was to be tempted. You know, the Bible says there was a meeting of the sons of God and Satan was present because it wasn't just a random meeting. It was a meeting of the sons of God. According to the Old Testament, every spirit is called a son of God. He is called the father of all spirits and the God of all flesh. And so when there was a meeting, it was a galactic meeting, if you would, for the Star Wars people. He called a galactic meeting because what is the definition of the word galaxy? A galaxy is referred to as a collection of stars. And what is the other name for angels? Angels are called stars, whether falling or standing. So when there's a meeting of the sons of God, it's a collective meeting of the galaxies, of the angels and their congregations. Because galaxies refer to a galaxy, refers to a collection of stars. So that means galaxies refers to a collection of multiple instances of stars. And so Satan must have been standing with the thought of the angels that got kicked out of heaven when they were standing in their own little corner, giving Michael the bombastic side eye for kicking them out. They were there and God was watching all of them like, okay, let's see what's going to happen today. Is Michael going to keep his cool this time around or is he going to kick them out again? Is it because the father is not threatened? He is God. Everything belongs to him and everybody works for him. You can change your portfolio, but as far as God is concerned, you still work for him. Satan used to be the anointed cherub whose wings shielded the glory of God's presence. And when he decided to fall from that position, God gave him another assignment to be a prover. God uses him to prove people. You say you are now the son of God? Remember when God spoke out of the heavens and the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus? God says, behold, my, this is my beloved son. He knew I am well pleased. And everybody was happy for Jesus. Oh, finally. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that alighted on him, led him into the wilderness to be tested of the devil. And what was the first thing the devil did? The devil read his assignment sheet. And it says, if you are indeed... The son of God. Did you get that logic? God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then he looked at Satan and said, Satan, did you hear that? Satan is like, say no more. I'm going to help you prove him. I'm going to help you test him. You see, because you cannot escape working for God, God is too calculated to suffer a loss. And let me tell you something. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, as long as you have life, you have to work for God. So choose your portfolio wisely. Because some assignments end up at the right hand of the Father, but some assignments end in the lake of fire. The beast, the antichrist, and the serpent, together with the false prophet, the four concomitances of evil, they will end up in the lake of fire. And unfortunately for them, they have already become immortals. So that means they will be there forever. They cannot die. (laughs) 
Oh, hallelujah. You see, when Satan was found by Jesus in the presence of the Father, what did Satan call Peter? Satan called Peter Simon because Jesus reported the situation to Simon exactly the way that it happened. He said to Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wind. The same Jesus had previously changed his name from Simon to Peter. But when it came to the matters of temptation, he called him Simon again because that was the name that he would hear when the tempter comes. And we struggle, even though we have tasted of the grace of God, we struggle to do that which is right because when the devil comes and he calls you a fornicator, you answer. Because let me tell you something, what you do is only a manifestation of who you are. You see, what you do does not override who you are. It is who you are that determines what you do. And so when the devil calls you by a name that is not yours, immediately say, oh, Satan, do you not know that the people who do that are fornicators and I am not one of them? I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So not today, Satan. Why Judah? Because of the grace of God. But why do we struggle? Even though the Lord has given us rest and we have had a taste of the graciousness of God because we are still answering names that God no longer calls us. So it is time for you. The next time the enemy comes and calls you a name that is not yours. You know, sometimes the devil will come and suggest to you to go and borrow. You should stop and say, wait a minute. The Bible says, I will not borrow, but I will lend unto nations. So only borrowers borrow, but I am a lender unto nations. Any more suggestions? If not, away with you. Get thee behind me, O Satan. Do you know that when Satan came to Jesus, he, he said, if truly you are the son of God, turn the stones into bread. And Jesus was like, the only way that I have to prove that I am the son of God is not by working miracles or doing magic. No, I don't. That's not how. I am a son of God because I am led by the Holy Spirit. So he said to him that, it is, that it, man was not meant to live for his own appetite only. You shall not live by bread alone, the things that give you pleasure, but you shall live only by the word of God. And so, check, he passed that. And when Satan continued to bother him, he reminded Satan that he wasn't just the son of God. He reminded Satan that he was the Lord. So he said to Satan, and that was the end of the temptation. He says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You can tempt the Son of God because he was led here for you to do your work. But right now I am done with this, so I'm going to reveal myself to you as your Lord. And do you tempt your Lord? And Satan was like, uh, actually, no, I'm out of here. You see how Jesus worked that out? And so whenever the enemy wants to weigh you down, Remind Jesus that you are not just a man. Remind him that you are one who is seated in Christ Jesus, an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus. If truly you are an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus, that means you are in righteousness always, you have peace always, and the joy of the Lord is the order of your day. I am who God says I am. I remember that song, I am what God says I am. That's what we used to sing. I'm a winner, not a loser. I am who God says I am. We used to say I am what God says I am, but I have since changed it to I am who God says I am. But I tell you what, if you can come to grasp that revelation and that insight, I wonder if we can get through all of the seven questions today. But we'll take one more. Come with me to Psalms 122. We're going to read from verses 1 to 6. Now, something that I want to mention to us very quickly, actually, I think we will see it here also. So let's, let's first of all read. Psalms 122, verses 1 through 6. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is 
that uh, as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to who? To give thanks to the testimony of Israel. Let me explain that for a moment. What was the testimony of Israel? The testimony of Israel was the name of God. Because when they tell them, how did you come out of Egypt? They will say, the Lord, our salvation, Yeshua. When they ask them, how did you survive? You were supposed to be hungry and thirsty. How did you make it? They say, the Lord, our provider. You see, so if you're wondering why Judah, it was because he found grace. And how did he find grace? Because Judah means praise. He never stopped to give thanks to the testimony of Israel, to the name of God. You see, let me tell you something. The testimony of Israel is not just God himself, but it is the name of God. And if you're wondering, John had that revelation, and that was the reason why he said, and they overcame him, that he's the opposition, by the, by the adversary, by the blood of the lamb, and by the words of their testimony. Because how did they, how would you overcome? That's, that's one account. Jesus gave another account that in that day, those who call upon his name shall overcome. They shall be saved. All right, so it is the name. So don't just praise God without being tactical in your praise. When you're giving praise to God, call his name. He wants to hear it. Call his name, call him the deliverer. Don't just say, Father, thank you for delivering me. Say, thank you for being my deliverer. Don't just say, Father, thank you for healing me. Yes, he did heal you, but there are certain times wherein herbs heal you too. You didn't hear that. There are certain times wherein you just put a band-aid on it and eventually the body heals itself. And so it's not just about what he does. It is about who he is. Just, as, just like it is about who you are. You see what I mean? So the way you overcome by not answering the false name, you can also get God to do battle for you when you call his true name. Verse 4, he says, Where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. So it's right here. I'm not just making up revelations here. You see it, it is the name of the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord. For the thrones are set there for judgment. The thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May they prosper who love the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper the people who come to recognize, you see, that it is important for us to stand in the right place. So, even though I've given you the answer, now I'm going to give you the question. Question number, what now? Three or four? Question number three. Oh, so y'all are following, praise God. Question number three is, where do you stand? Question number one, why me? Because I found the grace of God. Question number two is why not? Why am I not able to do this? Why am I not able to do that? Because I have been given a new name and that is the only name I should answer, right? And question number three and four, I'm gonna tell you from this same verse of scripture that we have read, question number three is where do you stand? You see, because where you stand is important important because there are certain places where God has put his name and when you call his name where he has put his name the portals open and the angels begin to go up and down remember what happened when Jacob said now this place shall be called Beth El it shall be called the house of God because the Lord has obviously put his name here he may have called that name in another place and gotten some result, but the most dynamic result that he got. Now, let me say this. I said this when I was standing here a little while ago, that we are not to make the grace of God of no effect 
And the way to make the grace of God fully effective in our lives is to recognize that that grace of God is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so how do you get into the fullness of the grace of God? You only get into the fullness of the grace of God when you call his name and you give praise to his name in the place that he has appointed because that is when the angels go up and down. It becomes a two-way channel. Because when it's just a one-way channel, the grace is sent to you, but you don't know how to operate in it. When you are only able to send things to heaven, you can become frustrated because you're sending prayers, but you're not able to receive delivery. It has to be both ways. And for it to be both ways, you need to stand in the place that he has chosen for you. And that was why when we were reading, it says, let us go into the house of the Lord, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Heaven is very clear on where you must stand. It says our feet are standing within your gates. And what constitutes the gates to the house of God? Praise. So we need to stand in gratitude all the time. I will enter his courts with thanksgiving. I will enter his gates with praise into his courts with thanksgiving. You need to stand in the place of gratitude and there begin to magnify the name of your testimony and then you will begin to see the fullness of the grace of God being made manifest in your life. The problem with many of us is that we have not come to learn how to be consistently grateful. We are only occasionally thankful. We're thankful when God does what we like. And when he's doing things that we don't particularly approve of, then guess what happens? We become murmurers. We become complainers. We become whiners. And you see that flip-flopping in and out motion actually allows for you to be cut out of the holy place simply because the holy place is meant to be kept in order. But going in and out, flip-flopping is what it means to be tossed to and fro. It's what it means to remain a Simon, someone who is like a reed that is easily blown about. But you are supposed to be a rock. The Bible says the ones that will make it into the new heavenly Jerusalem, they shall be like the pillars in the temple of God. And the reason why God brings them to become pillars is because they have become stones that cannot be moved. God does not want you to become a pillar in his house. When one day you can just change your mind and then the whole temple comes crumbling down. God is looking for people who are dependable. And the easiest way to become a superhuman in dependability is to become super dependable on God. The people who depend on God are dependable. <laughs> you didn't hear that. The people who depend on God are dependable. Because if you remain and you always depend on yourself, your wife cannot depend on you because the Bible says the arm of flesh shall fail. One day you will not be able to deliver because something will be beyond your ability. But if you're a man that depends on God, everything that hits you hits God because he is right behind you. You understand what I mean? Because you're always leaning on him. And so where do you stand? You stand in the place of gratitude always. The, the other question is, who are your comrades? Who are the people standing with you? You can't stand alone. It is important to stand, but it is better to stand in the company and in the congregation of the righteous. Simply because God did not make any one of us to live in isolation. The Bible says God places the solitary in families. If you are not intentional about doing life with people who are also chasing Jesus, foolish people will find you and they will gather around you because they are also looking for people. And the Bible says that the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. Have you tried going to a bar and sitting all by yourself? Or oh, someone's going to come and say, hey, how you doing? Yeah, because the moment they see you standing there, you look like a prey waiting to be devoured. 
That is the reason why the Bible says, do not hurry out of the presence of the king. Why stand in an evil place? Because your kingdom psyche is designed to be in the company of just men made perfect and surrounded by a company of innumerable angels. But that is if you are in the presence of the king. If you are in the place of gratitude. Let me tell you something. One of the easiest ways to attract the wrong company is to be a complainer. Because the moment you start complaining... They just come out of nowhere. They manifest like they are computer programs that just got printed out of the computer. They just show up, they're like, oh, have you noticed that thing too? Oh my God, it's terrible. Ah, oh my God. You see, complainers are very easy to find. They manifest like that. Because they're a dime a dozen. There's so many of them. There are billions of them right now. You understand what I mean? But then where would you find people whose lips are seasoned with praise? Where do you find people whose thoughts are conditioned by grace? You find them in the place where the Lord has put his name. You find them in Jerusalem. You find them in the house of God. Question number four, who is standing with you? Question number three, where are you standing? Question number one, again, let's just go through the four questions and then we'll wrap up on those and maybe we can talk about the other three questions later. But all of these questions, remember, they're supposed to bring you to a place of rest. Question number one, why me? Because I have chosen to be a praiser of God. Question number two, why not? Because I am not fully leaning into the grace of God by answering the name that he has given to me. According to Mark chapter 3 verse 16, that I am no longer Simon, but I am Peter. I am now a rock, one that is solid, solidly standing upon the word of God, maintaining my position regardless of the winds that blow, so that when the enemy comes and calls me the names that, I, that have not been given by my God, I do not answer. And when I don't answer those names, I do not do those things. Question number three, why here? Because this is where the Lord has put his name. Why do I stand in the place of gratitude? Because that is where he has put his name so that every time that I look up, I see the names of God written all over the walls and the pillars of the tabernacle because he has put his name all over the place. And so I cannot but be a grateful person because every time I open my mouth, I call the name of my testimony. And then why them? Why this company of people? Because the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. And so I need to be steadfast according to Hebrews chapter 12 in the company of just men made perfect. I need to stand with my comrades all the time. I don't need people who whine and complain and break down. I need people who exalt the name of God, even in the face of challenges. I need people like Caleb who will say, we can possess the land. I need people who can be witnesses to my testimony, as opposed to people who question the ability of God to deliver the lost, to recover the lost and to deliver the bound. No, 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 no. You don't need people who keep suggesting for you to try the things of the world. You need people who remind you to remain steadfast upon the promises that never fail. People who will tell you that you can't give up now. To whom shall you go? Have you not left all to follow him? Hmm. Okay, Romans chapter 1 verse 9 and Matthew chapter 17 verse 12. We're going to look at those quickly and see if we can quickly get to those three other questions. Because I, I was going to close the service, but then I, I, I felt the pull because people want to get to question number seven. So let's quickly go. Romans chapter one, verse nine. In fact, um, let's read that Matthew 19. Matthew 19, 12. And then we'll go to Romans chapter one, verse nine. And what does it say in Matthew chapter 19, verse 12? It says, for there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. Eunuch refers to um, okay, I don't want to get into get too deep into it because it, it, this is this these are some of the biblical principles that help us to answer the question of transgenderism. You know, because a lot of these eunuchs were perceived to be transgender because they were castrated when they were young boys, and so their bones were not able to develop as it should because they were missing all the testosterone and all of the chemical secretions that should come from that which was taken from them. So they end up growing taller than most people and their wrists become feeble. You see, the word eunuch actually has to do with the fact that when they move, they sway like women. You see, and so these eunuchs, 
if you understand the concept behind it, then you'll understand that there is nothing new under the heavens. A lot of what we're singing today, when you understand the principles of the word of God, you can address them better. But like I said, story, lesson actually for another day. But the Bible says, for there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb. I've already answered some questions already by just saying that. You know, because some people claim that they are born that way. And instead of you to say, oh, nobody's born that way, you're just living in sin. You have to understand that there are eunuchs who are born that way from their mother's womb who have those natural tendencies. But you see, to be born in a certain way is not a, uh, uh, an excuse to continue that way. There are people who are born with illnesses and we do everything within our power to fix it. There are people who are born poor, but we don't encourage them to stay poor. There are people who are born with disabilities and we encourage them to, 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 to allow themselves to grow out of it into some strength. And so the fact that you're born that way does not mean it does not become license for you to remain that way. You can choose to surrender your life to God and let him bring out of you that which he put inside of you. Not what he put around you just, but what he put inside of you. Because what is around you constitutes your outer appearance, your shell. Don't stop at the outward appearance. Search deep within you. Who does he say you are? For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Let me ask, let me tell you something. Question number five is why this? There are times wherein we are faced with things that we do not understand. Things that challenge our very own logic. Because when you read things like this, to be a unique means to be unproductive or to, be, to not have the ability to be fruitful. <laughs> So, when the Lord is leading you in a certain way, many of us, we are troubled greatly and we cannot get to rest because we're so adamant about being fruitful in certain areas of life. And the Bible says some have been made eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. Some have been made unfruitful in certain areas of life for the kingdom's sake. But if you do not know how to accept it, you will continue to wrestle in an area where the Lord has got no victory for you. There are many believers who have not found the Sabbath. Even though they have tasted of the graciousness of God, but they have not allowed themselves to be content with that which they have taken a bite of. You see, to taste of the graciousness of God is God's doing. He allows for you to have a taste, but it is not left to you to choose whether the Lord is enough for you or if you will seek another. The Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. After having tasted of the graciousness of God, am I content? Am I able to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I am okay. I am able to accept it. So they tasted of the graciousness of God, but they still have not come fully into the rest simply because they battle with things that the Lord expects for them to accept. But let me say this, folks. You have to know that that is the will of God. Jesus is not saying, oh, I would like this cup to pass over me. But in case if this cup refuses to pass, what's the other option? He wasn't guessing. He says, not my will, but yours be done. He knew what the will of the Father was. The will of the Father was for his life to be taken. Or for him to lay down his life, more appropriately said. Because Jesus says, they can't take my life. He said, it is in my hands. I choose to lay it down. You understand what I mean? Praise the Lord. So what is, what is when, the Bible, when, when, the, when you are asked, when you are asking the question, why this? That refers to the things that you may have tried to quote scriptures at. Things that you have labored on. Things that you have wrestled with and struggled. And yet you have no result. You will not have peace if you still think you need to have result in that area. You need to find out, am I a eunuch in this area? Did God make me to be a eunuch in this area, to be one that is unable to produce fruit in this area for the kingdom's sake? Do you know that there are things that I tried in the past to be fruitful at and nothing happened? 
until one day I realized that, wait a minute, maybe I'm doing this by myself. Maybe God has something else for me. Okay, I'm going to just let it go. See you later. And then for the kingdom's sake, I was led another way, wherein I found plenty of grace. Some of you know my story. When I was at school, my very first degree was in electronics and electrical engineering. I came in as one of the brightest students with high hopes of doing really well. When my grades were not measuring up, the dean of the faculty called me and the provost of the college, they called me to a meeting and they were like, did someone write your entrance exam for you? What about all your records up until you came into this university? Did someone do those for you? I said, no. I, I wrote those exams. And they're like, but what we're seeing here does not measure up. I was not able to bear fruit. And I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. I tried to help myself. In fact, one of the things that happened to me was I became so overwhelmed and frustrated and I took a leave of absence. But sometimes going on a vacation does not give you rest. Walking away from the problem sometimes does not give you rest. The only way you find rest by walking away from the problem is if you are walking to the solution. I took a leave of absence, but I could not sleep for many days. I was turning and tossing in my bed because I still had no peace, even though I was not seeing those same faces that tormented me. Because I, it had gotten to a point wherein, because of the expectation that was had of me to do well in that department, I would have lecturers while they're teaching, they would come particularly look at me just so that I know that they have an expectation of me. Even though I was not seeing those faces, I was not being reminded of those grades, I still did not have rest because I walked away from the problem, but I didn't go toward the solution. I had to let go and let God. Because there was no human or there was no logical reason for me not to be excelling. But yet I was not fruitful in that area. One day I closed my books from the library and I walked outside and one of my friends knew that something had happened to me. He followed me and he found me under the basement of the library. I was bawling. I was literally crying my eyes out. And he was like, he said, you know, you are the only one worried here. He said, I'm not worried about you. He said, because I know God has a plan for you. I felt so embarrassed because I was supposed to be his Bible study teacher. And here he was telling me what he saw that I was blinded to simply because I was not ready to accept. Some have been made eunuchs for the kingdom's sake. And the Bible says, Jesus himself speaking, he says, this is not for everybody. Some people will choose to continue to struggle. But if you can accept it, you will find peace. And I accepted it. And the moment I accepted it, somebody reached out to me and it was like, hey, we have this issue. I'm like, I can help you. And that was the beginning of my business. I made so much money, I nearly backslid it. And while I was struggling to keep my salvation, my father called me. He was like, I've been asked to voluntarily resign from the bank because they have a, 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 a what do they call gratuity package? What do they call it? A severance. He says the severance package is uh, crazy. He said, I would love to do six more months so that I can complete 36 years, but they're even telling me they will give me additional awards if I would leave now. He said, but what do I do? I don't know what else to do. This is all I've known since I was 19. And I said to him, I said, well, you said to me a couple of months ago that if this day ever comes, that you will call me and that we will do business. He said, oh, I said that. I said, you did. So now maybe we should do that business. One thing led to the other, even though after agreeing to the idea. I tried to run in another direction. I had to be bundled back home to fulfill that promise and commitment that I had made. But guess what? Within nine months, not only did we make profit, we were able to pay back every money that went into that business within nine months. My dad called me. He was like, we have paid for the building. We have paid for all the computers and we do not owe any of our employees or consultants. He says, what now? I said, we multiply because we have been fruitful. So we started building more buildings expanding the institution. I was fruitful in that area, but I was struggling to be fruitful in one, and I would have remained struggling if I had not come to accept it. Some of us just need to accept that the Lord has chosen to save our fruitfulness for other areas and just quit struggling. Let go, my brother, let God take over. You know, it's easier said than done, but to be honest, it is easier to do it than not. Because to not do it is to continue to struggle. 
But don't just whip that up every time you're faced with an opposition and say, ha, ah, maybe God doesn't want me to be fruitful in this area. Off I go. Let it be by revelation. Let the Lord himself reveal to you. You see, but some of us, the Lord is already revealing to us, but we're just not willing. You see, when you have an open mind, let me tell you something, you will not be led astray. The Bible says whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. Be confident in this process and not in your logic. That is number five. Why this? Now let us go to Romans chapter 1 verse 9. It's Saturday, right? So tomorrow most of us are just going to sleep at home. And kids are not going to school. So let's keep going. Nicole, can we keep going? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, Kayla's not here, so I switched to Nicole. <laughs> Please don't, don't post that on WhatsApp. Oh, you already did. <laughs> oh, she's coming for me. Praise the Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 9, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. <laughs> the next question is, why him or her? You see, for us to get to the place of rest, six is the number of man. So when you want to remember this question, just remember that six is the number of man, the number of people. So the question is, why him or her? This is different from question number four, why them? the group of people, your comrades who stand with you. Why him or her? Let me tell you something. For us to get to our peace, there is always somebody that the Lord will ask you to be in the gap for, to intercede for, simply because that one person may have an assignment that will prepare the ground for your generation. You see, the man of God was a man of God in the New Testament by the name of Ananias. Ananias was a powerful man of God. And he was getting ready to be sent to the nations. And God sent him to a blind man who was found on a street called Straight. And when he was told that he needed to go to Paul, who was then still called Saul, Saul was the deadliest man that they know. He was the most violent man that they had heard of. And his violence was very targeted. He was violent against Christians. And now the Lord was telling Ananias to go and stand in the gap for Saul. Do you know that Ananias would, may have said like you and I, why him? Why that murderer? You see, when the Lord says, pray for this person, they may be your arch enemy. Do not question why him or her. Get on your knees and intercede. There is always a man with a pitcher of water. There is always a man or a woman who is asking questions or whose life may in fact be questionable. It is not for you to judge. It is for you to throw in and be ready to make mention of them in your prayers always. I'm sure you can testify that there are certain people that keep coming up in your prayer and you have told yourself after a while, are they the only ones to pray for? Today, I'm actually going to give myself a break. I'll pray for somebody else. You see, when the Lord brings you these mystery people that he wants you to serve, do not miss the opportunity because you just never know. You see, God is the God of all, but he sometimes chooses to appear as the God of one. He leaves the 99 to go after the one, and sometimes he wants you to do the same because it's part of your training is one of the ways by which you get the attention of the host of heaven. Because there are certain people that get saved. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that when a sinner is brought to repentance, the angels in heaven, they rejoice. There are certain people that you minister to and it gets the attention of the host of heaven. And so when the Lord is telling you to rise up and stand in the gap for one or go after one, do not say it is not enough. Do not question if it is worth your while. The Bible says... Even for the least of the brethren, he will die. It is not our place to demean anybody. This is one of the ways by which we can attain rest in God. Simply because that one man may be a generation. That one man may be a fulfillment 
of a promise that God made. You see, when Peter was asked to go to Cornelius, God did not tell Peter, go to Cornelius and all of the Gentile nation. He just said, go to that one man because uh, he's, he's done certain things in my name and, and I want to reward him with salvation. So you just never know what deal that person has with God. You just never know what assignment God has already penned down in their name. And when God offers you to be an intercessor in the name of that one, it opens the door for you to find the meadows where the Lord has chosen to lead you for rest. And lastly, number seven, Proverbs chapter seven. We will look at Proverbs chapter seven and we're going to read possibly two chapters, I mean two verses, seven and 17. Seven says, and I saw, Proverbs chapter seven, verse seven, and I saw among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding. And verse 17 says, I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. Now, one of them talks about the state of a man, and the other one talks about the peril of the man. The state of this young man was that he was devoid of understanding. But what was awaiting him was a false promise of fulfillment. But because he lacked understanding, he could not discern that that which was being offered was a temptation, not an invitation for the fulfillment of purpose. Hmm. For you to fully come into the rest that the Lord Jesus is to you, for you to fully come into your Sabbath, you need to be a man and a woman of understanding. You need to understand. You see, when the Bible says the Lord gives you peace that surpasses understanding, it's because there is an understanding that is a heavenly understanding, not an earthly understanding. As long as you are leaning on your own earthly understanding, heaven says you do not have understanding because earthly understanding leads to death and destruction. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. You see, because your own understanding, as far as heaven is concerned, is not understanding because the Bible says that the ways that are wise to a man are foolishness before God. The wisdom of men is foolishness before God. So how do you come into the rest of God? You will not fully press into that rest or you may not fully enjoy the fullness of the Sabbath if you keep running with your own understanding because what it means is that you will walk into every door that is open. What it means is that you will answer every call that is made. What it means is that you will continue to fall for the antiques of the seductress because the seductress comes and says, oh, come, I have perfumed my bed. I have prepared everything for you. You begin to seek your own pleasure. And let me tell you something, anyone that seeks their own pleasure cannot find the Lord's rest. Jesus says, come unto me. He didn't say, go unto thyself. You have to come unto him. And so the secret, number seven, is this. I need to learn that the ways of God are not my ways. You see, because every challenge that I'm faced with that I try to resolve in my own understanding results into a vicious cycle of repeated occurrences because God loves me so much he doesn't want me to graduate from that class until I have learned what I should learn. So you just keep going round and round. The children of Israel, the Bible says with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, all three million people or so that came out of Egypt, they perished in the wilderness. Was that the will of God for them? No. The will of God for them was to come out of Egypt. It was about an 11-day journey to come and go into the promised land. But guess what? Because they will not give up their way of thinking, God made them to go around 
the mountain in the wilderness for 40 days until they all died out. And the only ones who made it were Joshua and Caleb. And why did they make it? Because those men stopped thinking like men. They gave up their own understanding. I'm talking about people who went to actually spy on giants. They went to spy on the giant race that built Jericho, the sons of the Nephilim, the Nephilim, the sons of the fallen ones. They went to spy their land. They were looking at them in the eye. These men were giants. And you know what they said? They said, no, these ones are nothing. We are able to possess the land. Ten other people who went with them, they were like, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Did you not see the size of those people? And Joshua and Caleb were like, no, we don't see what you see. You see fear, we see grace. You see the enormity of the situation, we see the potency of God. They were no longer leaning on their own deduction of the situation. And that is the reason why they did not fall for convenience. They did not choose to run away. They ran toward. Those people who ran away from the enemy ran to their death. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, he who loves his life will lose it. But the one who loves not his life unto death shall find it. Because usually where you think it is, is not where it's at. You need to switch your mindset from the way of the world to the way of the Lord. That is the only way to avoid getting killed in the bed of the seductress. Because the seductress is saying, I have perfumed my bed with aloes and my husband has gone on the long journey. The Bible says the young man in the foolishness of his heart came into the bed of the seductress and an arrow struck his liver. Simply because Man, the man's wife and the, man's, the woman's husband has gone on a long journey. What can happen? The reality of it is every bad thing happens simply because he was leaning on his own assessment of the situation and he was going with every empty promise that the, the, the instructors of life were putting forth. It was a test. We are always being tested. The only way to make the right choice all the time is when you learn to be a man of heavenly understanding. And once you are ready to think like heaven thinks, like God thinks, and sees through his eyes, guess what's going to happen to you? You will be at peace all the time. Because you know that there are times wherein you have learned to panic when you don't have money. Because money answers all things. And you're like, oh, how do I pay for that? How do I pay for this? But once you have come to be a man of heavenly understanding, then you know that your sufficiency does not consist in the abundance of the things that you own. But you are who God says you are. So to help those people who are taking notes, the question number seven, from what we have read, let's go through number one. Number one is what? Why me? Question number two is why not? Question number three is why here? Question number four is why them? Question number five is what? Who remembers number five? Why this? And then question number six is why him or her? And then question number seven is why up? And I'm going to explain that because it's a very difficult question. You see, many of us, we are always thinking of this plane, this realm, this existence. You've gotten to know it. You've gone to school for it. Oh, you've gone to the school of hard knocks. You have experience. So you always want to act instinctively on what you have seen. But the Bible says, think, let your attention be on things above and not on things beneath. The reason why up, the reason why above, is because that is the only place wherein you get a perspective of where your peace lies. You can't see it from here. You can only see it from above. And so if you learn to think as above and not beneath, your eyes will be open to see the place of your peace and you will walk into it and make your abode in that place and you will not be troubled. Again, at least not until the next lesson is ready. Because when I say you will not be troubled again, some people think, oh, heaven has already come, so they will not face temptations. No, at least not until the next lesson. But at least for now, you will have peace all around. 
Before we break bread today, I want to just encourage us with this word. I know that our time is fast spent. The text messages are coming in. But I want to encourage you with this. Because I haven't given you all a prophetic update in a while. And it's okay. Because some of us have already taken from that spirit of prophecy. And have, begin, have begun on their own to deduce what is to come by the Holy Spirit. I just want to say to you, no matter what happens, do not speak guile. No matter what happens, do not be afraid. No matter what happens, do not look them in the eye. He said the children of Israel were told not to look out the window simply because the angel of death that is coming, even though he was sent by God, can still terrify you to your very bones. So just mind your business. They will call you out. They will want you to come and see what is going on. But the Lord is saying, don't be found on the streets. Stay in your house. Stay behind the blood. Let, when they try to draw you out into arguments, stay behind the blood. When they try to get you to come and justify your action or inaction, as it might be, tell them, I am staying in my place. Because the days are coming wherein, you see, the way the Heavenly Father is sending his angels to separate the wheat from the tears. Satan is also sending his rodents to distract you. They want you to come out from underneath the blood. Stay in Goshen. Be steadfast, immovable. You see, because the days that are ahead, we're walking right now. Well, let me not say we, because I've been cautioned on this about two times this week. You see, what is coming is terrible, but it's not coming for you. It's, not, it's, coming, it's coming on your behalf to do you good, but it's not coming on you. You know, I told you that COVID was what? A rehearsal. It was a dress rehearsal. It looked pretty real, but we know that it is only a rehearsal, right? And so I will tell you a little bit about what's coming. You see, in COVID, we were locked down, so to speak. We were kept away from going to places. But what is coming is places will be locked down. I'm going to explain this a little bit because... The time is coming wherein, as the Lord wills, I will be able to spell it out to you a little bit more. But remember that in COVID, if you can leave your house, those other places were open. But with what is coming, what they're attempting to do is close down those other places so that they don't have to tell you that you're being locked down. But what's the point of leaving when you cannot go to the same places and take the things that you have always taken? The nuances are going to be a little different. But this is the real deal. And I say this to you because some of you were not here. Or you may not have heard me when I told you that the Lord showed me what's coming after COVID first before he showed me COVID. 2015, he showed me that which was coming. And when COVID was getting near, he, he told me that that one was a rehearsal. And so this, that which, which is about to come, is that, what, is that which I had described to you that I saw in August or so of 2015. And it is the flexing of the muscle of the beast. You see, COVID was, uh, that lockdown was, that's <laughs> it's nothing. But I say this to you because of the fact that you are not to be afraid, you are to be confident in God. You understand what I mean? When they say there is a lion on the street, some people become afraid. But some people become confident because they're like, well, if there's a lion on the street, then the lion of Judah is not too far from around the corner because he will never leave me nor forsake me. He will not allow his only one to see corruption. Neither will he leave my soul in Hades. And so this is what I'm telling you. I am telling you this so that you can begin to muster your confidence in God now. If you haven't already, aggressively muster your confidence in God so that when people are peeing themselves, you will be praising the name of your testimony. And the Lord says, I have instructed my angel that whenever he sees the blood, he should pass. 
How many people here are thankful for the blood of the Lamb? <laughs> Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. And the Lord said to me to tell you about three years ago or more, if you remember, that when we break bread, it's not because we have forgotten Jesus. Jesus is not saying do it so that you can remember me. He says do it in remembrance of me. It's a more blanketed statement, which means everything that needs to be reminded that it was you that Jesus died for will be reminded. Even the angel of death needs to be reminded that you are under the blood. So as you break bread today, say that I am doing this in remembrance of you. I am calling to remembrance the forces that govern life. I am calling to remembrance the powers of the principalities and the powers. I am calling to remembrance the powers that are above and the powers that are beneath and even the powers that are around. I am letting everyone know that the blood speaks for me and not against me. Call them to remembrance so that they don't accidentally strike you and say, oops, we didn't know. Don't let your life be left to chance. Be behind the blood. So as we break bread today, I want you to instruct your heart and say to your heart, hear the voice of the Lord today and receive courage. Hear the voice of the Lord today and be dependent on the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Remember a month ago thereabouts, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I told you, I said, God knows the ones, God knows you by how much you trust him because he knows the ones who put their trust in him. So as we receive the body of the Lord Jesus today and drink of his blood, do so by calling to remembrance all of the forces that are and remind them that Jesus is the head of all principalities and powers and you belong to him and you are in him. So henceforth, let no one trouble me for I bear in my bodies, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. This is for your immunity. This is for your courage. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. At the men's conference earlier today, as I was getting ready to be called up along with the other pastors to introduce ourselves and talk about our various uh, ministries. I just remember the word fed. You know, we're very interesting people like Communion House, we take back some things that have been taken from us. So we also call ourselves fed. We're the feds around here. And our fed stands for fellowship, equip, and disciple. Because there are organizations who claim to be the fed, and they're not the fed, and no one is calling them out. So we, we too we call ourselves the fed. Well, what can happen? If you know what I just said, you know. You see, with fellowship, we equip and we disciple. As that thought hit me, the Holy Spirit said to me, equip. When I heard it, it was a very clear word. So get ready. We are going into a season of equipping. Because when what is coming comes, we will be standing. Praise the Lord. Before I hand the baton over, I'm going to read to you a verse of scripture from Genesis chapter 11. I'm going to read to you Genesis 11, and this will be it. Since we're already here, we might as well just read one more. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. You see, even the baby is excited. 11.17, it says, after he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. The number 430 is a number of blessing. God said to Abraham, I will bless you and bless your descendants. In fact, the way that I'm going to bless them is that for 400 years, they will be in captivity. For 400 years. And we heard that it wasn't until the year 430 that the, deliv the deliverer knocked the door and said, I am here in the name of the I am that I am because it's time for you to leave that you may worship him. 
And look at what the Bible says. The Bible says that after Peleg, Peleg means to be divided. Ebar means the ones that have come from the other side. Let me explain this to you very quickly because of the fact that this equipping cannot wait till Tuesday. It begins now. The word was too express for me to delay. I was going to delay, but that word is standing with me as a witness. And that word witnesses along with me when I am in obedience. I do not pray for the word to witness against me. I'm going to give it to you very quickly. Peleg means to be separated. Because you remember Peleg was called Peleg because the entire earth was one continent until the year that Peleg was born after the flood, the Lord God Almighty, after he scattered the language, after the Elohim scattered the language of humanity and created various races because the Bible says they were one speech and one language. They had one tongue. They were one people because they came from the same family. And the Lord says if they remain one like that, they will continue to use the power of being one to go against the will of the Almighty God. So we change their tongue, race, and then we change their language, tribes, and cultures. Right? And so once they were grouped into different corners of the land, what did the father do? He separated the lands into continents. And that was the reason why Peleg was called Peleg, because it was in the year that it was born that the Lord God Almighty separated the lands. It's there. In Genesis 11, you can go and read it. This is not NASA. This is not National Geographic. This is the word of God. That the whole world was one. Because in Genesis chapter 1, what did the Bible say? The Bible says that God caused all the land to be gathered into one place. Right? And then in Genesis 11, he separated the continents. And that is the reason why you find that people who look alike seem to be found in different pockets of the continents. And some of them have no record of having ever crossed back. But there's record that they came from the center. You understand what I mean? So that is for Anthropology 101. We'll talk about that in a, another time. I'm really believing God for that building that we're going to move into next to have classrooms. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. Because I would love for us to have classrooms that are set up for different kinds of lessons. You understand what I mean? So what is the significance of this? We have come to once again the age of Peleg. Because the angels of separation are here to divide the lands again into wheat and tears. But the people who will make it into the blessing are the Hebrews, the Ebers. The word Hebrew comes from the word Eber. The word Eber means the ones that have come from the other side. Which part of you sitting here came from the other side? Aha. Question number eight. Which of you? Your body is from the earth. Is from the earth. You were made from the dust of the earth. But the Bible says, he that is from above is above all. Your spirit is not from here. Your spirit is a citizen of heaven that was inseminated into this realm because Jesus paid the price for the dual citizenship so that you can be from here and from there. At the same time, you're a son of man, but you're also a son of God. So let me tell you what is going on. Everything that is unfolding in the world today is to reveal the spirit that is in you. If it takes for your psyche to be broken, if it takes for your flesh to be broken, whatever it takes needs to happen because that which is Eber needs to come into the fullness of the blessing. All of this is that he may bless you. So it doesn't matter how treacherous it gets, how frustrating it becomes. He that is from above will overcome. Do not think about your pocket. Do not think about your table. Do not think about your flesh. Think about your Eber. Think about your spirit that is from the other side. The word Eber literally means the one that is from the other side of the water. And you know the Bible says he separated the waters from the waters. The waters above he called heaven. So your spirit that is seated in Christ Jesus is coming together with the Lord. And it has to be on top. And if that means that you have to go through all of these things so that that which is hidden in the heart can be revealed. Be of good cheer, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. God bless you, communion house. God is good, hallelujah. How many are thankful for the Sabbath? Come on, we're thankful for rest, for equipping. God is good. The given details are on the screen. We'll go ahead and press in in our giving tonight. If you need an envelope, it's here 
next to my sister, Manuelita. Hallelujah. Several ways to give. Yes, sir. Folks, I just remembered. Um, this week, the Lord said to me to encourage you to give sacrificially. You see, because quite often, we have... Um, we have needs that we should no longer be having as, as a community, as a group of people. And the reason why we still have those needs and sometimes why you know, we are not able to do certain things or fully pay for certain things is because we don't have money in the bank. And it's like, okay, why don't we have money in the bank? Do we not have people? You see, the Lord said to us at the beginning of the ministry, he says, if you do not worry about money, about raising money, I will raise people. Now, the Lord is raising people, and it's almost as if there is no money. And so, I am here today with a reminder word to let you know that God brought you here, not just so that you can be fed, but the Lord brought you here so you can also put your hand on the plow and be able to also bring at, to the apostles' feet that there might be a distribution that is worthy of our grace, even the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, let's not let our hands be short toward the work that is being done in this place. It is not the responsibility of one or two families. It is the responsibility of all that have been given the privilege to be a partaker of what God is doing in these last days. You see, I don't like to come to remind people because I just believe that if truly we are being thankful and being appreciative of what the Lord is doing, we will also communicate. The Bible says the ones that communicate to you spiritual things, minister to them in material things. You see, and that is the way that God expects it to happen. And so... Please do not see this as a scolding or a rebuke, or maybe you should, but then the reality of it is, let us do better. So that at the end of the day, we're not gonna, we shouldn't remain where we have been already. So Alan is going to come and bless the offering, and let it not be like the previous offerings. Let it be an offering of those people who have been reminded of their privilege as well as their responsibility to the things of God's work. God bless you, Alan. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for indeed you give seed to the sower. And Lord, you have equipped us and have blessed us with every good thing, every spiritual thing that comes from you. Father, we give you praise for being our provision. Now, Lord, as we have been encouraged, O oh God, even reminded in this season of multiplication, we shall press in in our giving, Lord. We thank you for reminding us, O oh God, of those tokens that you have placed upon our heart to be a blessing to this ministry, O oh God, indeed, knowing that it is fertile ground. And we give you praise, indeed, that you make us to be cheerful. Give us before you, O oh God. Let every offering presented before you from each of these households be found pleasing in your sight. Let it be sweet smelling unto you. And we declare that all glory and honor belong to you in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the name of the Lord again. Amen. One message in sure tonight, it was jam-packed. So this is definitely one. We need to run back. Uh, so many questions that are revealing answers that we need to press on. Amen. And so let's do that. Let's make sure we're playing it a couple times this week. Let it get in us so that we can be thinking on those things. Amen. All righty. I won't hold us. Everyone have a blessed night.